Wonderful. Well, we're going to today talk about updates on SDI, sexually transmitted, transmitted infection and pregnancy. We'll focus a lot on syphilis because I all, I'm sure all of you have had difficulty with penicillin and such too, but how important it is. So we'll dive into some important topics. So the state of STDs in the United States. So this is looking at 2021. So we're going to be talking about a couple of these today, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, you know, how are they doing? And really it, it seems um, like, well, I say every time this is a good topic to talk about because we've been getting so many questions, not only about STIs in general, but but mainly about syphilis. And and that's because there's a shortage of, of penicillin, of the treatment of syphilis. Yeah, the benzathine penicillin shortage has really hurt everybody. Yes, and that's been a, a really big topic for us all, all discuss, uh, to discuss and, and figure out how to treat these patients with, with a shortage of, of, of uh, penicillin. So... Today we're going to be talking about gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, and uh, you know, as far as who is at risk, you know, the the groups that are most affected are going to be young people aged fifteen to twenty four, uh, gay and bisexual men, pregnant people, uh, racial and ethnic minority groups, and you know, we're going to be focusing today on on pregnant people, and especially in Nebraska, uh, STIs and, and pregnancy has been kind of a big deal, right? Lately. Yeah, and, you know, that's where we are from. But overall, in the US, I was looking at the data we'll share too. I think um, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the STI clinics and things that we used to have free got shut down. So a lot of things just infections just starting to get worse, but we could do better. We just need to test and treat. So let's We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, here's just sexually transmitted infection prevalence, incidence, and cost in the U.S. So one in five people in the U.S. have an STI. So this also includes like herpes and HPV and all the other type of STIs too. Um, so totally nearing 68 million um, individuals have an STI of sort. And 26 million, a new STI since 2018. Almost half of the new STIs, so sexually transmitted infections, are in the young age group from 15 to 24. And of course, um, we spend over a billion dollars on treating for STI in direct and indirect costs. So all of us uh, have patients in our hospitals and the clinic and we should be thinking and treating to kind of help, not 1 billion, 16 billion, to kind of bring um, the infection rates down. So uh, when we're talking about STIs, we're not only talking about treatment for um, the pregnant woman, but also the baby. So any antibiotics we're going to give, we have to make sure that it's okay in pregnancy and, and with the baby. And uh, uh, as far as problems that you see, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the problems that you see, uh, not only with uh, the patient, with, with the mother, but also uh, with the baby. Um, and anytime we're testing for one STI, we also want to treat for other STIs. So if you have a patient that comes in with uh, chlamydia, you want to also check for gonorrhea. You also want to check for HIV. Uh, you want to make sure that you're checking uh, uh, because that person is at risk for not just one, but multiple STIs. And it's not uncommon to see a person with one STI have other STIs. Last time we talked about HIV, mm -hmm. um, um, but definitely HIV cases are going undiagnosed as well. So just like Dr. Horn said, if we find one STI, we should make sure we check for HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, mm -hmm. if you find syphilis, so we're catching all the other ones as well. And it should be, um, you know, I, I, I really want people to get tested really easily you know, and not have barriers to getting tested or treated. And, and part of that is, you know, if we have a patient that's in the hospital, uh, I also try not to judge, meaning um, I try not to say, oh, you know, I don't think they would have an STI or that's not the type of person I would expect to have an STI. I think it's better just to, to test as many people uh, as we can to try and get rid of these, uh, these infections. Yeah, so like if you find one, either in your clinic or patient, inpatient setting, let's say somebody has one STI, 
you know, just talk to them. Let's make sure we check for the other ones to make sure that you don't have it. But if you do, let's get it treated. So like having a very conversation without judgment is very important. Yeah. And and really it's um, people that are at risk should be tested frequently. Yeah. I think the recommendation is every three months or so yeah. for people that are at risk, which is, which is pretty frequent, but, yeah. um, but I mean, they, they make these recommendations for a reason. Yeah. Uh, Um, so chlamydia infection among adolescents and young adults, uh, of course, the cases are going up over 1.5 million in 2020. Um, and a woman who received the diagnosis of uncomplicated cervical already have a clinical upper genital tract infection. So a lot of women don't even know that they have it, mm -hmm. but when they have it, it's ca causing scarring and inflammation and only can imagine if you're pregnant, what it does to the baby, because it can complicate your pregnancy and can hurt, affect your baby as well. And as far as, uh, you know, symptoms, women cervicitis is the most common, uh, often no symptoms, about one third uh, have signs. Uh, a discharge, a mucopurulent yellow uh, discharge, uh, urethritis, salpingitis, uh, and you can develop infertility. Uh, and so a lot of those patients that um, develop infertility, they may not have had any symptoms and may not have known that they had it. Um, and, and again, this is a reason that, you know, that I'd recommend testing uh, frequently. So even if they don't have any symptoms, uh, you know, just uh, I'll ask patients, have you ever been, been tested? And if they say no, or they say, oh, a long time ago, I'll just say, you know, it's okay. We, we can test. It'll be negative. That's fine. And it also gives people, I think, a peace of mind. It's hard to take a test like this because it it's kind of anxiety pr provoking, but uh, it's better to, you know, once you get the results back, uh, have that peace of mind. Others, so endometritis, <laughs> uh, and then Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, that's where you develop scarring. And things. Yeah, it's inflammation all the way to the liver because of chlamydia. So a lot of complications that happen internally, but we miss it. And if you see the data, young people get it. So, you know, when somebody's young and has this, and then they get pregnant, you have so many other complications on top of having infection as well. And chlamydia diagnosis culture, only about 70% sensitive. So culture isn't the best test. Um, you know, when it comes to getting getting testing, really the best thing to do is get a PCR, get a, they call it a NAT. This is a nu nucleic acid amplification test, which is essentially a PCR. But it's better to get that because it's more sensitive than culture. So if they have uh, disease, it's more likely to pick it up yeah. is what more sensitive means. So urine PCR would be a good idea um, and to make sure you're checking. Yeah, and and uh, you know if you if you check a urine PCR, uh, that's a really good way to, to, to check. And then you don't have to do uh, swabs or anything. Yeah. You just check a urine. Yeah. Um, and then as far as treatment goes, so the recommend, recommended regimens for chlamydia is going to be doxycycline. So doxycycline two times a day for seven days. All right, go ahead. And then alternative regimens. So if they can't take doxycycline for whatever reason, azithromycin, one gram orally in a single dose. So that's good. So if they're in the emergency room or if they're in their, your clinic, you can give it to them and watch them take it. So you know that they took it uh, or levofloxacin, 500 milligrams orally once daily for seven days. So a week of levofloxacin. So um, for pregnant women, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you can't use doxy or levo. So the recommended regimen for chlamydia is azithromycin one gram. So that will be really important to um, use azithromycin one gram in, in for pregnancy to make sure that there's no issues for the baby. And then how about a test of cure? So sometimes we'll have patients that will say, well, how do, how do I know that it's gone? Or, um, uh, or he, he which is a very good question, you know, that people ask that also about, you know, urinary tract infections. They'll say, how do I know it's there? Do you want to test me again? And it's not necessary if they, if you're sure that they got the right treatment and they took it. Now, um, but in pregnancy, it's a good idea because 
there the stakes are raised and you want to make sure that, you know, that they don't have it. So in, for pregnant women, you can do a test of cure. Um, now, one thing with when you're testing again, uh, if you test now, the PCR is so sensitive that if you let's say you give them treatment and then you test them again two days later, yeah, it's still going to pick up that organism because it'll pick up dead, dead. organism. Yeah. It'll pick up, you know, fragments, fragments of it and, and dead organisms. So if you're going to test them again uh, and if you're going to do PCR, you know, then there's always a question of is that picking three up to three weeks dead organism? after treatment yeah. is the better way to do it. So at least that we have given enough time, but mm -hmm. definitely don't test it two days later because right. you're going to pick up the dead the bacteria. Dead bacteria. Yeah. yeah. And then it, it says men and women diagnosed with chlamydia should be rescreened in three to four months due to high prevalence. So uh, I, was, I was saying earlier that people should be tested every three months or so, but this is, um, you know, if they've been treated and then you're screening them again in three to four months. So those are people that are even at higher risk. Yeah. And the reason is because reinfection is the number one question. So in your pregnant females, if she has an STI and you're treating her, it's really important to ask who her partner is and make sure they get treatment as well mm -hmm. and ask them not to have sexual intercourse until both are treated and they wait a certain amount of time for appropriate treatment of the infection because we don't want our pregnant moms getting reinfected. So I think that counseling would be really important. Sometimes you could actually give treatment prescription for the treatment for the partner. So you could give it to them for them to give or ask them to come to the clinic. But it's really important to treat the pregnant mom's partner as well. And, and if a patient has it, you treat it and they come back and they have it again within a few months, uh, there may be, a you know, some people say, well, maybe that antibiotic didn't work and that's possible. But the more likely thing is that they went to their same partner and they got it again. And they didn't uh, have treatment. Right. Yeah. The partner didn't have treatment. So they're just reinfecting themselves. So, uh, you know, I, uh, partner treatment, I, yes. I, I think partner treatment is a very good idea. Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm comfortable giving I am also for people to treat their partner. I am also, but if you don't feel comfortable, then you know there's telemedicine now, phone visits now, mm -hmm. or asking them to come in. Um, but um, and then giving the advice to the mom that until your partner has gets treated, you don't want to get reinfected, high risk for your baby and yourself is really going to be important. Yeah, and here in Nebraska, we have Nebraska AIDS Project, and so people can go in and get uh, anonymous testing and treatment. And that's also if they can't pay for it, they can go to Nebraska AIDS Project and and they'll uh, get free treatment. Uh, gonorrhea, so prevalence <clears throat> highest in adolescents. Uh, Omaha is 1.6 times the national average, and asymptomatic infection 25 to 80 percent of women and one to three percent of men. Uh, and the transmission risk highest male to female. Co-infection with chlamydia, so. A lot of times these go together. So if a person has chlamydia, they're at high risk of having gonorrhea and the other way around as well. So if you're testing them, uh, you want to make sure that you test not only for one thing, but but for multiple things. And again, you could test for gonorrhea different ways diagnostically, mm -hmm. the, but the best way to do it is PCR testing. Yeah. Um, it's pretty fast, turnaround time, urine. Also, you could swab when you do your pap smear and things like that, too. You could also do throat swab, rectal swab. But in, anywhere you do it, PCR is a much better, faster result than culture. Yeah, and, and culture, yeah, so culture isn't as good. Uh, so, you know, if when you're thinking about testing, you should always be thinking PCR. Yeah, PCR, think. yeah. yeah, agreed. And let's see, the next one is, is going to be a treatment. So... Uh, for uncomplicated gonorrhea infections, uh, when it comes to treatment, you're thinking ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams, intramuscular in a single dose. So you can just give them a one-time dose and consider them treated. Yep. And we went up on the dosing. We used to have yep. 250 milligram because there's more resistance now. We have gone up on the ceftriaxone dosing to 500 milligram. So that's really important to know. And then let's say you're suspecting a pregnant mom having an SDI and you're worried that they might not come back. You don't have to have 
results back to treat. So just give them mm -hmm. ceftriaxone 500 milligrams plus one gram of azithromycin. If you're if you don't have the test results, but you have high degree of suspicion, this is one of those infections. So that's really important to know also to uh, treat if you if you're worried that they're not going to come back. And then uh, the next one, the next treatment regimen is for uncomplicated gonococcal infections of the pharynx. Uh, among adolescents and adults. So some sometimes people will get gonorrhea uh, that will kind of present as a pharyngitis uh, and you can either get gonorrhea or chlamydia this way. And so when it comes to uh, testing, sometimes people will swab um, <clears throat> or they'll do a PCR, uh, a PCR of the urine, but then also swab like a rectal swab, of, a swab of the pharynx. And there are some good studies showing that even if their urine is negative, that they may have a positive test from the pharynx or, or from their rectal swab. Agreed. So it's important to get a good sexual history and make sure we're diagnosing our patient. But thankfully, ceftriaxone works well with moms. Yeah. So in this case, we could give ceftriaxone and it's fine for pregnant women. And then as far as alternative regimens, if ceftriaxone is not available or the patient can't tolerate ceftriaxone, gentamicin, gent gentamicin uh, intramuscular in a single dose plus azithromycin, two grams orally in a single dose. Um, and you can either give gentamicin, gentamicin plus either azithromycin or cefixime. Um, any of those will work if they have an allergy. And then as far as complications of gonorrhea. So it's, it's good to treat gonorrhea because gonorrhea can be uh, very pathogenic. Yeah. It can be very bad. Uh, not only can it uh, cause things like pelvic inflammatory disease, but it can also get into the blood and people can get bacteremic. They can have um, joint infections with gonorrhea. Mm, uh, early pregnancies, <clears throat> miscarriages. So it's really important that we treat SDI. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about now about PID. So as far as presentation, so cervical motion tenderness or uterine tenderness or adnexal tenderness. So pelvic inflammatory disease uh, can be caused by a number of things. So if, if you have someone with pelvic inflammatory disease, you know, we'll talk about treatment in a minute, but trying to figure out what it's from and then uh, target therapy towards that. And moms can be at really high risk when they're pregnant with complications. So it's really important to treat. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you suspect uh, PID, not only do you have a ex physical exam, but you could also use um, some of the laboratory exam and temperature and elevated sed rate, CRP, and you know diagno uh, laboratory diagnosis of gonorrhea, chlamydia. All this helps you to treat PID. So in the next slide, we'll talk about um, what are the pathogen. So you could have not only gonorrhea, chlamydia, but also the anaerobes and bacteriovaginosis, mm -hmm. all those bacteria that are found there and how do we treat? So sometimes you treat for the SDI plus you add flagell. And then here's some of the PID antibiotics. This is treatment IV to oral. So uh, recommended uh, parenteral regimens for pelvic inflammatory disease. You've got ceftriaxone plus doxycycline plus metronidazole. So that's giving kind of a broad range. And then or cefotitan plus doxycycline or cefic, uh, cefoxetin plus doxycycline. So you might wonder pregnancy, we are going to get to that. This is just yeah. general way of treating PID for 14 days, um, a total of 14 day treatment. But if next slide, when we go, again, it's pretty much talking about intramuscular to oral, cephalosporin, doxycycline, um, and flagell. But thing to remember is what you do for PID in pregnancy, you replace the doxycycline with azithromycin. Mm -hmm. So the concern with doxycycline, it's, it's kind of a controversy now. We were in a lecture recently. Tetracycline is more worse for pregnancy and babies than doxy. But the concern is when you take doxycycline when you're pregnant, it can cause teeth discoloration in the baby, bone discoloration. So what they recommend is if you worry about PID, pelvic inflammatory disease in pregnancy, swap out for that regimen that we just talked about, replace it with azithromycin. Mm -hmm. And then going on to syphilis. So CDC uh, syphilis cases in the United States. <clears throat> and you can see the cases from 2017, 2018, 2019, how they're increasing. So 
syphilis cases are are increasing quite dramatically here, I think. Yeah, and it's even worse. I couldn't get the recent data from the CDC, but uh, definitely our cases are much higher now. So it's on a trend higher um, for syphilis. And you got you all can see, right, in 2020, we were kind of staying okay. COVID hit and the numbers just went really yeah, high. It should have been social distancing. <laughs> and on the next side, this is what I syphilis. this is what worries me the most. Not only yeah. when moms uh, have syphilis, but moms pass it on to babies, and babies can have lots of complication. And it hurts me to because I trained in um, internal medicine and pediatric long time ago, and when I was training, I didn't see a lot of syphilis in babies. But now it's becoming more and more common that we're getting congenital syphilis. So we'll talk a little bit about, about it. And this is why it's so important. Pregnant moms need to be tested so that it's like two people that we need to treat. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> congenital syphilis uh, is absolutely terrible when it comes to how it affects the baby. Um, you know, there it can cause miscarriage, stillbirth, premature, uh, premature uh, birth, low birth weight, uh, death shortly after birth. So... Uh, it, it can be terrible when it comes to the, the bones and, and uh, the teeth and everything. Anemia, yeah. uh, jaundice, also it, um, can cause nerve and brain development in babies, deafness, blindness, meningitis, skin disease. Um, there's also some heart problems I didn't put in here, like um, aorta, aortic root uh, can enlarge. So syphilis, I remember when I was learning, they used to say syphilis is the great masquerader. Mm -hmm. It can do whatever. So we have to have a high degree of suspicion and we need to treat this screen our moms and treat our moms and to make sure our babies do okay. And then as far as symptoms, so when you're talking about adults and their symptoms, uh, we have a picture of a chancre here. Uh, so A is a picture of a chancre. It's gonna be a painless ulcer. Um, and because it's painless, sometimes people don't realize that they they have it. Um, you know, when I see pictures of it, I'm like, how do people not know that they have this? But it's it's common for people to not realize that they had a chancre. Um, so uh, if they have a chancre, if they come in and they present with a chancre, then um, you know it you can, it's a clinical diagnosis where you'd look at it and say this looks like uh, looks like syphilis and, and treat for syphilis. Um, you would also do testing, but you want to make sure that while they're in the clinic that they do get, get treatment for it. And then B, this is a picture of secondary syphilis with uh, these lesions on the hands, on the palms and soles. So anytime someone has a rash, one of the ways to kind of characterize it or kind of think about it in your algorithm would be, does it affect the palms and soles? And if it does, then syphilis should all, always be in your, your uh, differential. One of the things that's important is like, uh, if you see a rash on the palm of your hand and foot, uh, you know, soles of your foot, there's not a lot of things that cause it. There are, you know, hand, foot and mouth disease. Um, uh, what else can do that? Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, but syphilis should be part of your thought process. If you have, if you see that, making sure we test for that. And then there, are, when, when we talk about testing, there are two main Yes. types of testing. There's non-treponemal testing and treponemal testing. So the non-treponemal testing is going to be like the VDRL. And the I, yeah, I get question because people get, they're like, what does that mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So there is what, how I think about it is syphilis specific and non-specific. Mm -hmm. So non-treponemal tests, it's non-specific. It's not testing the antibodies for syphilis. It's an indirect way of telling you that they have syphilis. So that's VDRL and RPR. Um, so that's what it means. It's, and then for confirmation to see you have actual syphilis antibodies, just like you say, I have chickenpox antibodies, right? Mm -hmm. That is triponemal uh, passive partial agglutination TPPA yeah. or fluorescent triponemal antibody absorption. These are direct antibody from the bacteria yeah yeah that's that's a good way to say it. Yeah. it it's it's um and when you think about it uh the the treponemal testing is always better yeah right it's always that that's the antibody to the bacteria the bacteria the right? other one is a indirect way of saying it so this is one of the things that 
syphilis can get confusing because sometimes they'll say, well, I have a patient, she's pregnant. I tested for syphilis. The triprenemal, I get, even today I was dealing with the is it the triprenemal test is positive, the TPP, FTAB is positive, but RPR is negative. So they don't have syphilis, right? I'm like, oh, hold on. Yeah. So yeah. in those type of cases, what you have to ask is like, do you have any symptoms right now, like the rash or chancre or any exposure if they say no? Mm -hmm. Secondly, you have to ask, did you get treated for syphilis ever? And if they say no, then you have to treat it. So what this means is like, let's say you have chicken pox and you get chicken pox antibody, you test it. Um, that will always be positive, right? Just mm -hmm. like that if you have syphilis, it'll always be positive. But if you never got treated, you have to treat it because the RPR will disappear after a while, but mm -hmm. the syphilis test will stay positive, like the TPP FDA. So just make sure all of you all, if you have a pregnant mom, she has TPP FDA is positive, RPR VDRL is negative. She does not ever remember getting treated. You need to treat that mom. Yeah, I do the exact same thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is always, yeah. why were they tested? Yeah. Because if they say, oh, they have, you know, what symptoms do they yeah. have? If they say, oh, they have a shanker, then, you yeah. know, you're going to treat. Yeah. Um, and then have they ever been tested before? And if they have, really, ideally, it would be... Um, there'd be a record of it somewhere like with the, with the state, there's some yeah. things to be, but I don't really trust it because I'm not always sure if, if it was reported usually, because it's supposed to be a reportable. Yeah. yeah. Usually the moms should be able to give us the answer, but you know, it's just, it's better to treat. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's better to, you know, if err on the safe side, which yes. would be treatment yeah. and that, uh, because that can have a big impact on the baby. Especially when you yeah. have the actual antibodies that are positive, which is TPPA yes. or yeah. FDAB. Yeah, the likelihood of having a, a false positive with that versus the impact of, yeah. uh, you know, what would happen if you didn't treat. And here, so this is the traditional screening algorithm. So we all used to, um, every, all of your facilities might be using different mechanism. So what we used to do is we used to do RPR first, and if that's positive, then you went ahead and did the FDA, BSO, a, a TPPA. To do a RPR in the lab, it takes about four hours. So it was taking up a lot of time for a lab personnel. So what they did was they flipped it. So a lot of places have gone from the traditional ways of doing this algorithm to the upside down way of doing is where they start with FDA, BS, the syphilis specific antibody. And then they will do the RPR afterwards, if that makes any sense. This kind of gets a little confusing. So do any of you have any questions on this at all? We'll show you the next slide. Yeah, because the RPR, you want to, you've always wanted to do the, the sensitive and then the specific yeah. testing. But the next slide. Uh, but the issue was the rate of syphilis was going up. And the lab personnel don't have the time to do four yeah, hour or, tests. Or money. Money, yeah, exactly. It, it, the reverse algorithm first started in New York. Yes. And it was the time and the money. Yes. And the time is the same as money, really. Four hours. Because, yeah, yeah, because so they, they can kind of batch them mm -hmm. and they can put them all together. And then, um, you know, they if one of those wells is positive, they can go back and retrace and see who's, whose it was because they can put them all together and it saves them a lot of money, but it's not, you know, in statistics, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do the specific then the sensitive, but we do the reverse algorithm here yeah. and they change the test actually when we order it. It used to say RPR and now it says syphilis, syphilis screen. screen. Yeah. Yeah. So people will will call and they'll think that the if the screen is positive or or negative, they'll say, oh, the RPR was negative. But we have to tell them, oh, the screen actually we do a reverse algorithm. Yeah. So it depends on which test you all have. Either way is fine. Mm -hmm. The faster way is the reverse algorithm. So a lot of folks have gone to syphilis specific antibody. If that's positive, then they'll do the RPR. Um, if that's non-reactive, they'll do an, so they'll, they'll do two different specific antibodies. So initially they'll do the FDABS and then RPR positive, you're done. RPR negative, then you do the TPPA. It's a different syphilis specific antibody. If that's positive, it's positive. It's that's negative, it's false positive. So you have 
you do step by step. And this is what a lot of places have gone to do. Yeah. And and when it comes to false positives, that's a question we get frequently also is that what could cause a false positive in this person? And one of the causes of a false positive would be like auto autoimmune yeah. disorder. So we have a list of all oh. of that coming up. Oh. So here we have what causes false positive for RPR, the nonspecific and the syphilis specific. So here's oh, a list of things. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so non treponemal So uh, there are other infections that can cause a false positive, but including pregnancy. So if you've had someone that's been pregnant multiple times, that's a risk factor for having a false positive RPR. RPR. And yeah. this is when you need to look at the TPPA. But sometimes the TPP will be positive falsely too on the mm -hmm. other. So then you have to look at the RPR. So sometimes it gets really confusing. That's why we are yeah. here. Please call and talk to us. Um, but um, these type of tests sometimes can be false positive. And here are some reasons when that can happen. And then as far as syphilis, you know, anytime you have these positive tests and then the next step, if you're if they have the diseases to identify what stage they're in. So do they have primary, secondary, early latent, late latent? Uh, do they have neurosyphilis? Do they have ocular syphilis? And so, uh, and, and the important thing there, once you uh, find out what stage they are in, it, uh, it's important to do because that affects treatment because then, you know, the treatment may differ depending on the stage that they're in. And, oh, and then one more thing with that is that it's important to look down here at the time frame because if they uh, just recently acquired it, also that it uh, will affect what stage they're in and, and treatment. So did they just recently acquire it? Do they have a new chancre or uh, did they have a chancre a long time ago? They didn't, didn't ever recognize it. And then now they're, you're seeing them and then they have neurosyphilis or they have uh, ocular syphilis or they have, you know, uh, yeah. findings um, like in their spine and their. And the reason that's important is it, it di different how, how much penicillin you, you give and how yeah. long you give it. So we'll talk a little bit like one of, if it's early, you just do one shot and you're done. So mm -hmm. if you have a chancre or if you have like rash on your arm, all you have to do is just give one shot of benzodiazepine yeah. penicillin. Secondary, the same thing. But if it's latent, then you'll have to do once a week for three weeks. Um, so it all depends on what stage you're in. And then when... Do you want to do, uh, when do you suspect meningitis or when do you want to do a CSF uh, study? So when do you want to get an, a lumbar puncture for the patient? Anyone with syphilis who has neurologic or ophthalmic signs or symptoms, evidence of active tertiary syphilis like aortitis, gamma, iritis, or treatment failure. So if they failed treatment, could it be that they didn't get long enough treatment because they have a later stage than you suspected? Um, and so uh, this is kind of a hot topic right now. I think the major thing is that, especially if they have any kind of neuro symptoms, uh, if they have e even a headache, I would say that, you know, an LP would be a good yeah. idea because you want to treat them aggressively. Headache, vision. Yeah. Um, some of my patients have ringing in their ears. That's mm -hmm. neurosyphilis. So making sure we get really good history. So before we get into treatment, so benzathine penicillin is in shortage. Um, um, so CDC is recommending all the healthcare facilities to take an inventory of what you all have and really make sure those are reserved for pregnant moms. And then alternative regimens are used for other folks. Um, so benzathine penicillin, they're really encouraging to reserve for pregnant moms and higher need. Higher risk. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah, the need. Yeah, and and um, so it, treatment for so the benzathine penicillin, so that is in shortage, but we're not we don't have a shortage of the treatment for neurosyphilis yes. syphilis and ocular syphilis, so that's that's okay. But that's regular penicillin. You know, you put a pick line, midline. You know, give you give IV antibiotics for fourteen mm -hmm. days. You have that. You just don't have the benzathine penicillin that you give once a week shot for three mm -hmm. weeks. That's in shortage. So, and when it comes to studies showing that other things work, there have been some studies showing that ceftriaxone may be a good plan or doxycycline. Um, it's really, 
uh, people haven't been wanting to do studies. Yeah. And I think for good reason, because yeah. they didn't want to split people up yeah. and not give people the treatment, treat, the, the um, treatment of. Uh, but currently CDC does recommend doxycycline yeah. for early and then latent doxycycline as well for 14 to 28 days. But that is not for pregnant mom. So in the next slide, we'll talk about pregnancy. So if you have a pregnant mom with syphilis, it should be penicillin. If they're allergic to penicillin, we need to desensitize the mm -hmm. mom. Either in the hospital, outpatient clinic, but patient mom needs to be desensitized. Pregnant mom, penicillin is the drug of choice. Um, so that is really important. And in your healthcare facilities, if you have benzathine penicillin in our facilities, we have prioritized this for pregnant moms. Um, and of course, Jerex, how do you say this? Uh, Jerish Hirsch, Hirschheimer. Hirschheimer reaction. Hirschheimer, yeah. When you give <laughs> antibiotics to a pregnant mom, especially for syphilis, the um, bacterial load is so high, immediately they get a headache, myalgia, fevers, rash. And people think it's because they're having an allergic reaction to the penicillin. It's not. It's just the bacterial load is so high, you're having that rash reaction yeah, lysis it's, it's the lysis it's the the bacteria when they burst yeah all these little bits and everything are, are very inflammatory and so they have this going in their blood yeah. all this uh, these bits and pieces of, of this bacteria which um causes a, a very big reaction in some people and so for the first 24 hours so they'll get a dose of penicillin and then they'll have this big reaction and they may go to an emergency room and they may be told never have penicillin again, you have an allergy. Yeah. And part of it might be that the ER may not realize that why they got the penicillin and realize it's a Jarosz Herxheimer reaction. And a lot of people don't even know this reaction. So like, yeah. you know, they might not even understand it. So just please be aware if that happens, it's not allergy, just monitor the mom closely. Yeah. Treatment, if you don't treat it, the baby's at risk. So just monitor the mom, treat the mom very closely. And there was a uh, uh, an HIV clinic where when they would treat people yeah. for, for syphilis with penicillin, they would tell them, if you feel bad, don't go to the emergency room. Yes. <laughs> I'm not at that point. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that to someone. Yeah. But they would say it because they know that, you know, when they go to the ER, they're going to be told you have an allergy to penicillin yeah. and they won't take their next dose yeah. if they have a three dose plan. So I think yeah. what you all can do is when we are treating our pregnant moms or anybody, Warn them this might happen. Yeah. And if it happens, please call me so I you all can walk them. Call whoever yes. the provider back so you can reassure them and you know set them up to expect this might happen as a reason. So antipyretics. Yeah. So if you wanted to give them like Tylenol and Benadryl and things like that to kind of help. Um, to, yeah, yeah, to just essentially treat the symptoms. Uh, help them through it, basically. Yeah. yeah. But it for their next dose, they they this shouldn't be happening. This is just Essentially, they had a high bacterial load, and then they had a big reaction when, when all those cells lice. Uh, syphilis follow-up. So serology, VDRL or RPR, decline. So you want to do a follow-up test uh, and then make sure that their titers uh, decrease. We'll show a picture in just a minute. But you want to show a sustained or, oh, sustained or increased VDRL that... Um, Retreatment. Then, oh, sorry, would be bad, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so you want to retreat. So yeah. make sure it's coming down. If it goes up, you have to treat it them again or um, re-exposure. Um, but um, again, some of your pregnant females won't even have an RPR. Only thing they'll have is a TPPA, the syphilis specific. You just treat them and call um, it good in those cases. And then here's the RPR titer. So anytime you have a positive hopefully you have a, a positive RPR as well, because then it reinforces that, you know, that they do have yeah. active syphilis. And then it also gives you something to follow. So you want to see, let's see, it says two dilution, fourfold rise in the titer clinically is a clinical change. If you only have, if it goes one to four to one to eight, then you'd be saying that that's uh, may not be sig yeah. significant. Yeah. Because when they're diluting it, you know, that's within the the error of the labs. Let's say you retest somebody and initially there was one to four, six months later, now they're at one to 1,024. 
that's like a significant, <clears throat> even yeah. though you treat it, you probably want to treat them again. Either they have reinfection or first time around it didn't work. So like just, it. this is a helpful tool to follow. Right. And when it's high, so if they have a like a 1 to 128, when you recheck them again, generally I'll recheck them again in, in two to four months. Mm -hmm. And I want to see that it's it's decreasing. decreasing. And then I can tell them, you know, they're doing a great job. It's coming down. That's a good sign. Yeah. Now, if they come in when when you originally diagnose them, if it's a one to one, uh, so if they're testing as positive and then they have a one to one on their RPR, it could be from old disease, yeah. or it could just be from untreated, untreated yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And then, as as far as pregnancy goes, um, it's really important also to like um, test for hepatitis C and hepatitis B and. Um, so we just need to make sure that not only are we testing our pregnant moms for HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, make sure we test for HIV, uh, sorry, hep C, hep B. Um, so that mm -hmm. if it's positive, they can be followed as well, just to kind of plug in for mm -hmm. that. And that's all our right. last slide. So, so any questions on STIs yeah. at all? Any questions on syphilis? Like any, have you all been having issues with getting penicillin? Similar scenarios like we just talked about. All right. Well, we're, we are always available. So if you have any cases, um, you know, any cases at all, we're always available. You can always call us and, and we'll discuss the case with you and see if we can uh, figure it out and help you with it. And then if you have other topics you would like us to cover, uh, send us an email and we'll take care of it for you all. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody.